Uh, you know, for me, I mean, obviously the Hot Wheels loop was probably like my sort of that's creme ridiculous. De la creme. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it, you know that that came out of um, Mattel actually coming to Bandito Brothers, which at the time Mouse McCoy um, owned and the company production company he had started, really with the idea of like we all it was was agency had an idea for Hot Wheels for real, mm -hmm. so let's come up with something. The loop, every kid had the loop, right? I grew up with the loop. Hot Wheels mm -hmm. meant so much to me as a kid. My kids have all had Hot Wheels in their pocket, mm -hmm. you know, growing up. Both of my oldest one and my youngest, I mean, years of having Hot Wheels in their pocket. So we really kind of came up with this idea of doing these three world record stunts in a short amount of time. The world record longest jump, which was at uh, 8,500 with Tan Tanner Faust did. And then the um, corkscrew that Brent Fletcher did with the doom buggy, which or the buggy. Mm -hmm. And then the loop that Tanner and I did together. Seven stories high. Um, there was no way to test. I mean, the only way to test it was to do it for real. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't ease into it. You know, the build, the, what it took to build it was just so crazy. But you know, you think about the team. One of the things we were talking about earlier, it's like the the people in our industry are the greatest people on the planet. Like I just, I just am so thankful and gracious every day that I get to wake up and go hang out with buddies. And mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times it's hard to sell my wife on the fact that the job's <laughs> tough, well, it was a tough day. It's like, hey, you're just with your buddies all day. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, come on. But, but it's you know, way I mean, gnarlier than that. that yeah, time, exactly. That and you think about, you know, with the Hot Wheels stuff, I mean, I had like all my really close friends, Jet Boat Billy, everybody knows Jet Boat Billy. Great story about him later, but you know, we grew <laughs> up, I've known that guy since we were little kids. And he's the one that actually built the car that, uh, that I drove through that loop. So I had a lot really? of faith. And you know, when you got you have your best friend, designing the car and making sure the cage is right and doing that stuff, it's pretty special. Like it takes yeah. a little bit of the stress off of somebody that you don't know. So and of course, Tom Mason, the Mace, like OG original, badass, like the group we've grown up with, so much fun. A solid right? group, yeah. Always just a great time. Remember, you know, and Tom was like, yeah, Mace was a great, a great guy to bounce off some of my nervous energy and stuff. He had his motorhome out there. We basically designed that loop going back to the gnarliness of it, uh -huh. um, seven stories high, thinking about, okay, what can we do to cover some safety stuff? Well, we came up with this idea of doing a drone car. So we built a life-size, the same car that I was going to drive with a remote system in it, had this top, no top doubt, uh, huh? remote guy come out to drive it. We had a net underneath the, the uh, halfway on the, on the loop. Uh -huh. So we're going to drive this thing around and just try to make sure the math, because it was a Helix, you had two cars coming in and meeting in the middle you know, and the G load's gonna be like over seven Gs. Are you gonna be able yeah. to keep the car straight? Or once it goes, are you gonna be able to like lift? You know, there's so many things that, that there wasn't an answer to. Mm -hmm. So we built this car and uh, we were running behind with the build, a lot of other stuff going on. We basically had to give ESPN a yes or no the following day as to whether, or a couple days later, whether this was, was gonna work or not. So I'm standing looking at this giant loop, watching this remote car get ready to go. My dad's standing next to me. Jet Boat Billy's there. Tom Mason, obviously. Mouse is there. The whole crew. And the whole crew's there. And uh, we got a lot riding on this thing. That drone car goes in there, gets to the top, goes no through the bar, way. comes down, just destroyed, right? You're in it, you're dead. You couldn't, you could not handle that kind of seven story crash, regardless of, yeah, no. you know, roll cage or whatever, you know, kind of apparatus you're wearing on your head. So, I'm watching this and my dad says to me, he's like, I, I don't know what they're paying you for this, but it's not worth it. You know, you got a family, you got little kids and uh, I think you should call it. So Pops is telling you to pull the plug. Yeah, pull yeah. the plug. And my dad's a badass, right? So coming from him, <laughs> yeah. it's like, I, I get it. Like that's, uh, you know, weighed pretty heavy on my heart. So yeah. I walked over and, you know, this goes back to like growing up in motocross and you think about, you know, Ricky Johnson, all the guys that we've grown up with, we've had so much fun with, Kenny, like everybody, like we've had this great group to grow up with that you learn so much mm -hmm. from motocross. I mean, whether it's like just figuring out your line, you know, now you're going to hard pack, now you're getting blue groove, the lines are changing. All the stuff that happens that becomes like very just natural instinct to happen, I think makes a big difference for being a good stunt guy mm -hmm. and being able to really like process a lot of information because it's still cowboy, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people think like, oh, the guy's got the slide rulers and they really figured out the mechanics of this loop. Well, not really, to be honest, <laughs> like you showed up, originally it was gonna be five Gs, it's the same size deal and all of a sudden I show up on the day and now it's seven plus Gs, like what happened to those other two Gs, right? <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot, yeah. That's a big difference. And. Uh, so it, it's still, and, and the stunt business is the same thing. There's never enough money. There's never enough time. I mean, obviously, 
you can figure out all sorts of stuff if you have if you have time and money. Mm -hmm. But you're always missing one or the other or both, right? Of course. And uh, long story short, getting back to the loop, so we get to that point where we didn't have the time, and at that point we're at the end of the deal. We had to make that decision. I went and looked at it, and again, could I interject real yeah, quick? What happened with the drone car? Well, so Why the fuck that, did yeah, it make it? I'll lead right into that. So yeah. that's, when I went and looked at the the deal, there was basically railing on the edge of the on the edge of the track until you got to the vertical point, the point where you really needed it. It wasn't because now you had two cars coming in to meet in the middle, right? So I could see that there was a tire mark along the inside rail up to like the point where the railing was not there. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, thinking back about like car racing days and stuff, you get up against the wall on an oval track, you can't get away from it. You know, you see the cars get up against the wall and they just get stuck. Well, it's the tire just gripping, it's just pulling it back. You can't, you almost can't get away from it. It just keeps sucking it into the wall, right? Mm -hmm. So. My assumption was, looking at this, was that the drone guy had gotten into it. Whatever feedback he was getting from his uh, remote wasn't translating to what was going on with the car. So he's up against that thing and he's trying to turn away from it and it's not turning away from it. So at the point where it got to the top, now the wheels are this way and it just shot off the side. Oh, it's you just actually a guess, saw it. right? It shot yeah. off the side. I mean, you know, you look at the videos and stuff we had, mm -hmm. that made the most sense to me. So we had put so much effort, again, going back to like effort and time and you know, psyching yourself up, like you're doing something big like that. I, there's a lot of sleepless nights. There's 405 freeway, freeway, I would get off on Lakewood, there's a holiday in there, and I would count up seven stories every time I got off that exit <laughs> for seven what? or eight months, right? You look at yeah. like, holy shit, that's a long ways, man. I don't want to fall from that, you know? Yeah. So you kind of go through that process. So now I've seen this car crash. I think I know what happened. Mm -hmm. I say, listen, guys, I'm going to do this tomorrow. We're going to do it. Just get things fixed. We're going to do it. So I go home, realize that the next morning, my uh, son was graduating from junior high. Oh, my daughter shit. was graduating from uh, kindergarten, going into first or into second. Anyways, and my little guy, uh, who was there as well, thinking, okay, if I get, you know, I've got their graduation parties first, and you know, if this thing doesn't work and I get killed, <laughs> am I going to screw up their like school life forever? Yeah, like this oh, is not sure. a good dad moment, right? <laughs> no. So all night, no sleep, couldn't sleep at all get up, go do the, the uh, little graduation stuff, uh -huh. go there, Fletcher's ready to go. Um, Brent Fletcher, who's coordinating the whole deal for me. <clears throat> and uh, we're gonna do like a 10 count on, on zero, I'm gonna go. And so they start counting down, they get to eight, I just go, take off. Like I just Fuck had it. to do it, I'm doing it, right? Hit it, come through the other side. Holy shit. I knew I made it. But it was always like, we had so many questions as how it's gonna work. Could you keep the thing straight? Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. So they asked, well, were you able to keep the wheel straight? I'm like, I, I think it worked out perfect. It was straight. Well, the car is like lifted up off the ground, see this way, and realized that the lower control arm on the, the left rear tire had snapped on the entrance, on the no entrance to the, to the loop, which lifted up the right front tire, which meant that I had to counter steer all the way through. So the whole thing, you look at the video, I'm doing this. No, no memory of it because you just had the great G load control? was so high. The Fuck. blood, your blood goes from your head to your feet. Yeah. So you're basically semi-conscious, right? So um, I really had no recollection of it, or my recollection of it was different than what it actually was. But we made it. You're so, a solid driver, dude. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> you know, it's instinctual. It's like you do anything ten thousand times, your body just knows to do it, right? Yeah. So. Hop in my car later, guys. We made it. Super psyched. I'm going to. Uh, so you just did one rehearsal, just or, one, or, or just did one, one time. Yeah. I'm gonna come back and do it later you know, next couple of days. But that gave them the opportunity to tell ESPN we were good to go. Driving home, wife calls me, hey, you gotta hurry up. You got Lane's graduation party. You know, he's at the beach. You gotta hurry. There's 18 burritos. You gotta go by and pick them up. I'm like, oh, okay, 18 burritos, all right, I got it. All right, cool, babe. <laughs> Hang up. And I'm like, wait a second. Like, I just risked my life, you know, broke the world record, like had this monster deal. She didn't even ask. It was just about the burritos, right? <laughs> and it was that moment of like, hey, life is that way, right? Yeah. There's no magical moment that you just wake up one day and go, you're a badass, or this was a superstar, or this or that. <laughs> you're just still the guy going to get the burritos for the kids, yep. right? The baby's diaper needs to be changed. <laughs> they, yeah, exactly. So that was a pretty, like, you know, it was oh, a pretty great funny. moment. But at the end of the day, you know, our, when we actually got to the X Games and wow. Tanner and I are walking towards the cars and there's, you know, 50,000 people there and, Billy, jet boat Billy walks by him and he's got a tear in his eye and I look over at him and I'm like, well, that's not very reassuring, you know? <laughs> but it was just such a buildup of energy and, you know, so much care and love for everybody. I mean, that's the reality of, of the business that we live in. Motocross, I mean, I think motocross, and that's why motocross and stunts and 
just work so well together. It's such a similar, and you know, a majority of stunt guys either have raced motocross or came out of motocross or love yep. motorcycles or whatever. Uh, but it's a very like, it's a, it's camaraderie, you know, and it's mm -hmm. a very special relationship, you know, like you've pushed the edge and, you know, something even about getting hurt. I mean, a lot of people go through their whole life never having broken a bone. Mm -hmm. That seems crazy to me. Like, <laughs> it really does because you have to, you know, you think about, you know, asking a girl out or trying to ask for a promotion or ask for more money or whatever. It's a lot easier if you've been through a lot of gnarly stuff. Because mm -hmm. then at the end of the day, what do they say no or whatever? Not a big deal. Right? Exactly. But um, I think it's a pretty great way to live. And you've watched so many people that have had great success in business or in other ventures, whether it's stunts or, um, you know, whatever they choose to do. But a lot of them came out of that came out of racing and came out of motocross and mountain bike racing and you know this where you come from as far as your racing background i don't know if you you're from moto or car racing but kind of give us a backdrop there. yeah so um interesting path i mean everybody has their their path that they take to end up in the stunt business and stunt driving business um for me i started off my dad was a motorcycle racer mm -hmm. and raced desert he was cmc number one for a while water ski racer speed skier just all around just badass dude so we grew up uh, sort of shadowing our dad, my brother and I, Gary, who's a supermoto guy for a long time himself, Pikes Peak champion, um, and really started off in motocross. I mean, that was our, our first thing. I remember going to Indian Dunes was our first race. I think I was 13 years old. In fact, I broke my foot that race, but no I think way. I was leading when I broke it, like ADB inner class or something. So my dad was psyched that, that we were doing well and my brother did good. So, uh, so wait, your first race, you actually broke your foot down? Yeah, yeah. Oh, broke my foot Indian dudes. That's not easy. Not easy. <laughs> and it was great though. So we, we grew up close to Saddleback. So Saddleback was our home track. So that was a easy day to, you know, through high school to go practice. But so for some of our listeners that don't know where Saddleback is, where, where is yeah, Saddleback? Yeah, so that was Orange County. It was okay. off of um, Chapman, like the 55, and I guess would be like the five, kind of where they intersected. Amazing place. I mean, a lot of superstars came out of there. But um, yeah, so anyway, so I was racing motocross and uh, started when I was 13, really 12, 13, and turned professional when I was 15, and really had planned on racing supercross and the nationals and ended up doing, I think, one or two nationals and six or seven supercrosses. I broke my back for the second time um, at Anaheim Stadium in 86. No way. And so at that point, I was like, yeah, my dad, you know, I just started uh, college. And uh, college and you were racing motocross, yeah, full time, right? Wow, so it was a lot. I mean, it was a lot to try to undertake, but um, ultimately that led to wanting to race off road cars, you know, while my back healed. And then I was like, well, that's not going to work. So we got into racing carts and ended up racing the national championships and some international races and doing well with that. That segued into formula cars wow. and uh, really with the intention of racing the Indy 500, came real close to 96 with a team that some of the sponsorship fell through sort of last minute. Um, but had a great career, like a lot of fun, and ultimately ended up in the stunt business through my connection with Mouse McCoy, who at the time I was living with, and we were best friends, and our dads actually grew up uh, in the desert desert racing world together. I think they were checkers together. Nice. So they ran into each other at a race, maybe it was at, I don't remember exactly where, Saddleback or Indian Dudes, and they rekindled their friendship. And so from an early stage, Mouse, when he, they would come and race Saddleback, they would stay at our house, and we'd stay at his place just down the road here no we're racing Indian dunes and travel a lot together back of the pro track trailer and the truck cross country so yeah, yeah definitely so that was the start so did you ever race with with mouse back in the day mouse and I raced against each other a bit um I'm sure he would tell a completely different story but you know we were kind of right at that point I was rising fast he was already a superstar we had some good runs together okay very and, cool uh, I mean ultimately the the we ended up racing the Baja 1000 together and winning the 1000 together in 2002. Oh, no way. Which was was the, that the Dust of Glory? So that was, 2003 was Dust of Glory. Okay. So 2002, we won the race. I got off the bike, I think, uh, a little past the halfway point. Mouse picked me up. We drove back across the border and all the way back driving. It was just like, man, someone's got to make a movie on this thing because it's just too cool, you know? Yeah. Like, you think about, and it, that was really like, we spent six, seven hours driving and eight, ten hours, whatever it was. And Mouse kind of going through the process of what a film would be like and what you what it would take to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how that began too. No way. So yeah. you were kind of there when those seeds I were planted. I was right there. Yeah. That's pretty so bitching. That was pretty cool. Holy moly. So fast forward to Pike's Peak. You broke your back for a second time. I actually I just watched a clip of you doing that and I was yeah. like floored was at how intense that must be. It's a pretty wild race. I mean, and what was funny for me, I've always pushed myself um, 
almost by like letting it out there that I'm gonna go do something. So Pikes Peak was coming along, I think uh, 96 was the first year I raced it. And of course I had read about it in Cycle News over all the years and thought, ah, that's something I'd like to go do. At that point I was kind of transitioning out of the, out of racing cars or thinking that maybe that wasn't gonna be my career. I'd kind of already moved into the stunt stuff. Um, so I read about Pikes Peak. I'm like, I'm just gonna do this. So I started telling people I was gonna do it and ended up sort Putting of forcing myself there. that I had to go do it. Mm -hmm. And I ended up winning the 250 class that first year that I went and just fell in love with it. But that particular, you know, for people that don't know about Pikes Peak, it starts at 9,000 feet altitude, goes to 14,100 wow. feet, let's say. It's 12 and a half, 12.42 miles, 156 turns. And uh, 96, the first year I raced it, it was all dirt. I think it actually- Wait, all dirt? It was all dirt. So it was like a TT? All, basically, yeah. Wow. And, you know, so you run predominantly, at that point it was smaller CC bikes, I think 450 was the max. Okay. Uh, dirt track tires. Yeah. Um, and then that transition to environmental issues. That, oh, because of dust or whatever yeah, and getting into like habitats. Yeah, one of those or... BS environmental deals, you know. Yeah, so, talk for about, sure. There's, remember Bobby Unser talking about it. There's 50,000 miles of unpaved road in Colorado, and you guys are concerned if there's 12 miles. <laughs> it's always about power, right? Of you know, course. Making, trying to get land grab stuff. So, oh, man. Uh, so we ended up watching the slowly transition to all asphalt. And I think, I want to say it was 2010, it was, it was fully... Asphalt, yeah, the, cl the clip top. I saw was 2012. Yeah, yeah and it was, that was 100%, all asphalt. 100% all asphalt, yeah. asphalt, yeah. So that was an interesting transition because I wasn't a road racer. I came from a motorcycle background and wasn't a flat tracker. I was a motocrosser. But I had road raced cars, obviously, a lot and oval tracks. And mm -hmm. um, as I transitioned back to Pikes Peak, so there was a lot of things, I think, that worked well together there for me, being able to put lines together. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, as 2008, uh, or 2007 BMW showed up with the big bore bikes and they changed the rules to allow 1200 cc motorcycles saw the handwriting on the wall it was still all dirt but I knew that that was ultimately gonna be the overall records would get set by the big bikes mm -hmm. so transitioned into to racing for BMW with oh, wow. in fact, the first year that we did it was with Mickey Diamond and my brother Gary Tracy oh no way we we're teammates and Casey Yarrow, Yarrow so oh, very cool. badass group so much yeah fun. absolutely yeah. kind of give us a uh a glimpse of what that's like, trying to nail that track down. Because, I mean, I could tell that you, it almost looked like you had it memorized, but maybe not. You, can you really memorize that you track? You memorize it. You I mean, there's definitely times you still, you know, there's, a, there's a fair amount of corners there that feel like previous corners. So, yeah. especially when the motorcycles, uh, originally you would race four at a time. Now mm -hmm. they go to just one at a time. But you get those four-way battles and you're tucked in behind somebody and you come underneath them and all of a sudden it's like you just kind of get lost Yeah. with where you are. Obviously knowing that course is, is everything. But you look at like all the guys that have come out of there that, that are in our business, Reese Millen and you know, Mike Ryan in the semi trucks and mm -hmm. uh, goes on and on, Eddie Mulder way back when. Um, I think with Pikes Peak, as, especially as it's transition and with asphalt, the speeds are so much quicker. So your braking distances are shorter, your ability to make a mistake um, has gotten a lot tighter. Mm -hmm. So I think we went from like, the dirt days of a top speed, like maybe 110, to my last year with racing for Ducati, um, I think I was 158 was Holy the top speed. Holy crap, man. So you're hustling. I and mean, you're, you're, mind you, you're not on like a flat area. You're on the side of a mountain. Yeah, side of a mountain. So it's either drop off into the trees, drop off into rocks, big yeah. cliffs, and there's a few guardrails on the tight stuff. Mm -hmm. I managed to crash in a few different places there, and I've had some big big, big crashes for but sure. But you're with us, so yeah, you were fortunate. Yeah, fortunate. Where yes. you fell, okay. Right. So that happened, uh, so 2008 BMW ended up with um, the factory Ducati team for mm -hmm. about four years, gave them their first win for the Multistrada, their first win for the Hyper Motard. Um, so how does that work exactly? Was there like a, a series that kind of worked in with Pikes Peak? No, it's just, it just a one-off race. It's one-off race. One okay. time a year. So what other events would you do that kind of correlated with that event? Supermoto. I mean, we were doing a lot of Supermoto at the time. I was kind of there in the beginning of the AMA Supermoto stuff. Okay, before that kind um, of went yeah. disfunct. So and that was, you know, top 10 guy. Yeah. Um, but no training, no riding in between to show up for the races. Yeah. I was busy with work. And that and was more kind of moto, real yeah. moto related exactly. stuff. Yeah, yeah. I was still starting to learn how to slide a motorcycle on asphalt. And that yep. was, made it easy to then transition to the big bikes. Definitely. But uh, yeah, Pikes Peak was a great thing for me. I mean, I ended up um, winning it seven times. So did and... you pre-run it to get that? I mean, or how does well, that work? So, how did you yeah, learn Pikes those Peak, corners? They, obviously it's just over the course of time, but you have the, the race week, mm -hmm. um, you practice, they divide the mountain into thirds. Mm -hmm. So one day is, uh, let's say the bottom third, middle third, top third. 
you always qualify on the bottom. They've got the cars going at the same time, so maybe the first day might be the top, next day on the bottom, you know, third day in the middle, then you have a day off, and then you have the event. Okay. So the trick with Pike Speak, I mean, you really have to be one of those guys that can, um, not your standard, like, road race guy that shows up and you get a 150 laps on the track, you know exactly, everything's the same, there's rubber put mm -hmm. down on the track. This is totally green. It's like a mountain road. Mm -hmm. and you show up and uh, predominantly practice is done before 8.30 in the morning, so the temperatures are super cold. Race is usually after one in the afternoon. Real temperatures hot. are really hot. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we've gone in rain, we've gone in snow. You know, you have corners that you turn in that were a great corner last time you went through two days before, and now there's snow, melted snow water running across. So apex out at 125 miles an hour, <laughs> starting to slide oh. the rear, and you're like, whoa, that's water, step it up. You know, yeah. it's just, it's constant stuff like that, besides the spectators and dust and rock and wind and cold and yeah, it's crazy. The, it's the like dynamic kind of is totally different than yeah. a road race, right. a conventional race, yeah. So I think, you know, it suits guys that are capable of um, making small mistakes and not make, turning them into big mistakes. Definitely. Do you yeah. think that helped having kind of a, a Baja background a little bit? I think it's a combination of everything. I mean, between the car, for me, it was the cars and you know, there's been plenty of fast guys that have come along that had different backgrounds there. I mean, Carlin Dunn, who was my teammate, Okay. And who's done a great job, had the record until this year, and KTM came and So took KTM it. holds it holds the record holds now? It now, yeah. Nice. But uh, you know, for me, I mean, it was always the the records are great, but mm -hmm. conditions have to be just right and the records change, they, you know, things come and go. Um, my personal like probably biggest accomplishment for me with Pike's Peak is I'm the only guy that's ever broke the ten minute, which was like a really el elusive number to get for one lap under 10 for, minutes yeah to the top for under 10 minutes but it's actually it's just it's actually not a lap huh? it's bottom just, to the top yeah yep so but uh under 10 minutes on a motorcycle and in a car so really yeah so that's uh mm -hmm. first guy to do it and what's the only faster guy to start. your car or your motorcycle? cars are definitely quicker i mean just because you have a bigger contact patch mm -hmm. you know not that we weren't i mean my quickest times on the bike i was probably in the top six or seven overall really with the supercars you know i figured so yeah so, but you know Apples to apples, uh, it's contact patch. Yep. Motorcycle's that big, car you got this much. Times, times four. four. So, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like Formula One and MotoGP. Exactly. It's hard to, to yeah. bridge that gap. Hard when to you beat got the MotoGP that. guys though. Yeah. They just look cooler. <laughs> they so, do. Well, it's more like dancing, <laughs> like Val Valentino Rossi. I remember right. him making a comment where riding a, a bike is like dancing versus a car is kind of like, you know, not dancing really. Yeah, exactly. I've never raced a car before, but uh, I'm sure it, you know, it, it totally different feel, you know. When yeah, well, that compare. was actually really interesting with Pike's Peak, the first year that I raced for Mitsubishi. You know, you want to turn in. I was so comfortable with where I was supposed to be on the course. So, you know, there's a lot of corners where I'd have my head out, you know, knee over the curb, over the edge of the road, mm -hmm. and my head's like two inches off the trees, three feet into the forest, right? Yeah. You just know those spots. You got to kind of look up where that... Yeah. And obviously you can't do that in the car. If I put myself in that same place... Would was, you still be trying to do that in the yeah, car? Yeah, but I had a couple times where you started to turn like, whoa, whoa. You know, no, not here. Yeah, it took a little while to get used to that. Yeah, I so. bet. So would you do that on the same day, or, would, or did you ever do it at the No, same they, time? they don't allow that. I would love to have done that, but that yeah. was, that's not. You can only race one. You get one class. Okay, yeah. so then you get to pick, okay, this year I'm going to go ahead and, and do it on the bike, right. or next year I'll do the car. Yeah. That's cool. What do you prefer to do? Any preference? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if I have a preference. They're both, they're both great in their own way. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing with the motorcycles, as we all know, is they hurt when you crash. Mm -hmm. They hurt a lot more than, I mean than a car for sure you got a of course. <laughs> cage around you but uh my last cra I crashed there in 2012 the year that i broke the 10 minute mark mm -hmm. the sunday before shooting a commercial for ducati they had just uh been bought by audi and okay. so they wanted to do like kind of an anniversary thing and i made a deal with them that i would get to do one run from the bottom to the top which the only time you get to do that is the race mm -hmm. so and that's only once a year so i felt like that was a uh obvious um you know, advantage going into the race the following weekend. Yeah. Stock motorcycle wasn't my race bike. Few adjustments that we make on the on the motorcycle, including raising the foot pegs, mm -hmm. you know, three or four inches, so you get the thing leaned over farther. And uh, turned in at like 95 miles an hour, tucked the uh, touched the peg and shot off. Went in legs first, fractured my hip, broke my lower back, got knocked out. Wait a minute. No memory for three days or two days, anyways. You did this just before this you was set the, the record. Sunday before, yeah. So then Holy Wednesday. Shit. Wednesday was the first day of practice. I have zero recollection of. Thursday, a little bit. But they'd wow. pick me up, put me on the bike, do my run, come back down, pick me up, lay me on the ground. And, uh, <laughs> and that was a bummer. I really felt like, you know, Carlin ultimately ended up getting the record that 
race, but we both bo broke the 10 minute mark. We were close, you know, six seconds or something like that, but I couldn't lean, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't lean on my right knee. Yeah, no. So I had to ride a little more straight up style and I lost some, some time there. Holy shit. But those man. are the kinds of things, you know, you look back on it, it's like, would I do it again? Would I recommend it to somebody having, you know, that big of a head injury? I mean, obviously you crash again, that could have been. Could game have over. Killed yeah. you, yeah, game over. But when you put, you know, it's like anything, you put so much effort into something and um, especially on something that's only once a year, the idea of taking a whole nother year to come back and do it just didn't, I was like, no thanks, I'm, coming, I'm gonna do it, you know? Yeah, and I'm sure so, someone like yourself, you were probably also thinking about the rest of the team and all the efforts yeah, that they exactly. put in. And it was like, man, they're all here, they're ready. Yeah, I don't wanna disappoint everybody. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure, though, on their standpoint, they're like, look, dude, we're cool. We're cool. You can go ahead and now, you know, take it easy. Now, Ducati is one of the best groups. Um, Jason Chinook, who's there again now, one of the greatest guys. I mean, just like, I, mean, I broke the motorcycle in half. That and I was so upset. I remember talking to him once he showed up. and He's like, damn, this is racing. I expect motorcycles to get broken in half. You're not broken yep. in half, so that's good. You're yeah. racing. It's great. Not <laughs> a big deal. It's just a motorcycle. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you don't That's get as cool. much of that in the car racing, you know, the car stuff. I watch that transition because of the cost mm -hmm. to they really, you know, when I first started racing, like crashing was okay as long as you were going for a win, you know, mm -hmm. you're just pushing it. And then it became where it was so expensive that you were now a little bit of a liability. They'd almost rather, rather have a guy that was willing to get fourth place or third than somebody who's trying to get the win and crashing, you know. Yeah, make it for broke. So, and, yeah. Yep. Which I'm a, that, I think it's better in racing if you have sort of a go for broke mentality. Cheers to so, that, man. Yeah, good stuff. I like it. <laughs> Cheers. I'm the opposite to that. <laughs> you guys do the entertainment. Ah. Mm. Well, bitch and stuff. So, um, how did uh, how did you get into car racing, though? Let's kind of get a background there. Yeah, so car racing after the motocross stuff, breaking my back. My neck at Anaheim Stadium, 86, mm -hmm. you know, I could see And how old were you again? You were only 15, 16? No, no, that, that was, at that, I think I was 17. 17, 17? just turned okay. eight, 18, because I was in January. That's right, you turned pro yeah. when you were 15. So and I was then... 18, yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, so transitioned into racing go-karts, which was fantastic. I mean, right away we took to it. My brother started racing karts as well. We did well, national championships, international stuff in Peru, went down and raced the South American championships. It's huge down there. Huge, huh? I mean, it's as, it's as big as it gets. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, that's where all the F1 guys come out of at some point. Mm -hmm. So, came back, we started looking into um, what was next on the Formula Car ladder. And at the time, it was the USAC Formula 2000 series. So, transitioned, we, we got a car and went out and did that, took to it right away. Mm -hmm. And uh, really saw the Indy 500, that was my next, that's where I wanted to be next. That was your goal. And uh, making a quick run towards that, I got to race with a lot of the superstars and teammates with guys that you know went on to win any 500s and things like that. So I knew where I fit in. Uh, but again, I came from a very middle class, you know, my dad's a contractor and um, he put everything he had, everything that this is the greatest guy in the world. My dad and mom, they devoted, devoted their lives to giving us the opportunity to race motorcycles. And I remember our garage walking in there, I mean, you know, nine to 11 year old brother with four motorcycles and mm -hmm. you know, your stock and modified bikes and 105s and <laughs> All that stuff. Oh, yeah, it's endless. <laughs> yeah. So, but that was a great opportunity. I mean, greatest time of my life. Number one, it was just so much fun, and all the people that we we met out of that. And uh, so, the transition to the cars was it was a different experience. Obviously, the cost was excessive in comparison to the bike. So, I really had like a couple of years to try to make it happen, which I did. And then, who supported you financially to kind of get you that that boost? We had that a combination. I mean, ultimately, it was my parents. Really, my dad was the one that, that got us going. Really? We ended up getting sponsors, you know, sort of early on that help offset helped with expenses. A lot of it. Yeah, and at the time, it was, still wasn't that expensive. We watched that transition from like ninety one to ninety eight, let's say that that cost didn't just like go up ten percent. They like quadrupled. Really, you know, four hundred percent, eight hundred percent, because now you had telemetry and now you had testing, and uh, you know, six way adjustable shocks or whatever. I mean, it just kept going to the point where if you really didn't have now, yeah. yeah not that there weren't guys that were able to kind of find their way through without having deep pockets but it became very difficult so i mean that's what ultimately segued back into the stunt business was mouse was working uh i think at the time as a pa with joe pick a famous commercial director mm -hmm. and so many of the guys you know steve strauser and um friends that were working in that louis franco mm -hmm. uh, on and on bike guys that had transitioned into the film business were there and I was, was kind of starting to do some stunt stuff, stunt driving, and kept talking to me about it. Uh, at the time, I was still going to school, and I was, you know, kind of recovering from a broken back and starting to race carts, and now starting to race cars. And that transition in the stunt business where guys were not just like jack-of-all-trades, master of none, they were starting to get a little more 
targeted for I need a car guy or a fight guy or a fall guy or specialized specialized yeah. so the timing was just really kind of perfect that a couple movies came along driven was really the first big one that I worked on oh awesome with Spiro Rosados who's such a rad guy and you know the gills and Steve Kelso so it was a great opportunity for me to get in there and we brought in a lot of formula car guys sort of to fit the mix too but Kelso and I really got to do and Andy a lot of the heavy lifting on the driving side yeah and that was a great like moment of like hey this is like a really great business I can crash cars and people clap yeah and they're not like pissed <laughs> off you know <laughs> exactly I don't have to write a check to anybody I'm getting paid to do this exactly so that was pretty cool and uh, so that all kind of came in as, as like one never program, expected yeah. to ever to me I was still trying to race full-time stunt thing seemed like a good way to make some money yeah and uh, mouse was you know already in it so made it like an easy so you and mouse were pretty close and yeah so it then was we like... started doing and the car commercial thing obviously um, I was brought in uh, mouse's father was friends with a guy named Jim Kirby who owns LA prep which is one of the biggest prep companies mm -hmm. and he was starting a driving team at the time and was also kind of doing some racing so we were introduced and that was kind of my segue into the car commercial stuff which has been a great you know ultimately ended up on drivers inc yeah uh which kind of it's the been a great career, the, man. yeah it's been a great career it's been a lot of fun so gnarly but it's funny get to the point now and you know you just do i want to crash my brains out not really do i want to hit my head anymore not really let's get a cage yeah and i love <laughs> you know let some of the young guys come and do that stuff and yeah um and i'm i'm 100 percent fine with that you know like i it's funny, I think you transition in the stunt business where, you know, just as a guy, so much of the, your early, you know, your, your late teens and your 20s, you're trying to prove that you're a badass mm -hmm. as much to yourself as you are to other people. You know, it's mm -hmm. like perception and what, what do people, and you get through that at a certain point. I mean, I think for me, like I've crashed harder, harder than anybody or as, as hard as anybody, I should say, mm -hmm. without killing myself. And I know what big pain feels like. Very cool. So what's it, uh, what's your future looking like? Are you still looking at, you know, after obviously you heal up and then all that good stuff, are you looking at Pike's Peak, you know, maybe yeah. doing on, a, on a bike again or? I think I'm finished with motorcycles there, although I never yeah. say never. Okay. Um, so no some, more on the, on the bike then you pretty much, honestly, but I'm you not, never know. I'll though, never huh? say never on that. I mean, yeah. there's still a possibility. Pike's Peak's a pretty special place, but you know, I, 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 at the point of my career where I want the overall, whether it's on a motorcycle or a car, Question so, real quick. Did, did you ever do Isle of Man? Since never did, did Isle of Man. Came no? really close, actually. I bet actually. you probably wanted I would to, have, though. I would have loved to have done that. Yeah. I mean, I think I've sort of aged out of it or, you know, how much risk you want to take. Because that's um, kind of very the same similar. thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, in fact, there's a really interesting guy named Mark Gardner who, who wrote a book called One Man's Island. Mm -hmm. And he went over there and, and, you know, lived there for a couple of years, learned the history of the Isle of Man, and then raced it himself, and then came and raced Pike Peak a couple of times. So I had a lot really? of insight into what that might be you know, to go race there. Guy mm -hmm. Martin came over and raced Pikes Peak one year. We okay. became pretty good friends uh, at Pikes Peak, so. But it never materialized, it almost? Never materialized, almost. I almost went there on the electric, with the electric motorcycles okay. when that first started. Rod Millen was gonna build a bike for me. Uh, Reese Millen's dad, who's superstar driver, you mm -hmm. know, himself, multiple time Pikes Peak champion. And uh, yeah, it just didn't happen. But, you know, you get to a point like on that stuff. I mean, I got, I got kids now. I got to put was a lot of food say, on the table. I got colleges to pay for. Did, did the wifey, you know. like, you know, when you told her, hey, what do you think about the Isle of Man? I'm sure she was probably not too keen on yeah, it. Yeah, huh? she was actually, uh, uh, she was a neighbor. So mm -hmm. she saw me in a wheelchair, saw me on crutches, <laughs> you know, so many different things over the, before we ever started dating. Yeah. In fact, I think that when she finally decided to, to go out with me, I was riding my little guy's bicycle and little tiny kid's bicycle and just showing off, doing little wheelies in front of her. And I went to pedal and snapped the frame and <laughs> went into the curb and split my chin open and oh, had to go get stitches, picked up the two pieces of broken bike and walked home. I was like, all right, I'll see you later. <laughs> oh man, that's too that funny. That's when I finally won her over. So, yeah. Oh, I gotta love but, it. Yeah. She probably saw how composed you were and was like, oh, yeah, this right? guy's pretty solid. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I could like this. Yeah, funny. Right so, on, man. Chicks like risk takers, right? Is there anything out there that, that kind of sticks out in your mind where you're like, man, I'd like to uh, kind of get into this little area and, and shed some light on, on something that I've experienced. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I mean, I think you get to a stage in life, and I must be at that stage right now, where, you know, I spent my whole life, like I thought I was going to be a professional motocross racer. That's how I was going to make my living. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing with automobile racing. And then ultimately ended up in the stunt business, and that's where I've, you know, made my, made my living and mm -hmm. raised my kids off of, you know, crashing cars and sliding cars. Mm -hmm. and, pretty great way to live um, have so many 
wonderful friends and it's just like camaraderie that you don't get in a standard like going to a cubicle job mm -hmm. so so grateful and thankful for the opportunities that I was given by a lot of people there was not uh, you know sure you make it happen yourself but it was a lot of people reaching out and you know grabbing me by the hand and pulling me up to get to the position that I'm at and yeah. I try to really you know people I get calls at least once a week people have tracked me down on drivers Inc website or different stuff trying to figure out how to get into the industry mm -hmm. and you know what I'll give them as much time as I can um, and try and help them out and 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 certainly that there is no you know a lot of people nowadays oh there's no way to do it no no there's a way to do anything mm -hmm. we live in a land of opportunity like we are so crazy lucky whatever you want to do you got to put your mind to it and you prepare and continue preparing for it and keep pushing you will get there for me now segueing to what you said I've done so much that I feel fortunate about whether it's winning Pikes Peak you know seven times is eight times or ten times mm, does that really add anything to it not really mm -hmm. you know I've got to have a world record with the with the loop I've gotten to be in a lot of big movies and work with some of the best guys and Darren Prescott and you know Black Panther just recently and mm -hmm. R.A. Rondell and I mean superstars guys that I, like, I really looked up to that I've you know gotten to become friends with and work with mm -hmm. um, but I'm enjoying the stage of my life now where I can just kind of pick and choose fun stuff that I want to do it doesn't have to be about winning anymore it mm -hmm. can just be about having a good time you know that's why Day in the Dirt is so special guys yep. go out I mean not that there aren't the guys that are out there trying to win and do whatever they have to to do it but to just go out there with your buddies and be a part of something and have fun now it's like watching my kids grow up and you know I've actually gotten into some sailboat racing related stuff Long Beach Yacht Club no way. total you know something I would have never ever expected that I would have wanted to be involved with but watching my kids now doing the sabbats and swim race you know there's like swimming racing whatever we <laughs> would swim meets right yep yep and uh just doing something different you know there's so much out there to enjoy and so many different opportunities to maybe I want to do some so you're racing some offshore boat racing I don't know sailboats you're racing sailboats now possibly my kids are more involved in that than I am okay yeah, I'm not still want the power. I still want to throttle. But that's cool, offshore though, man. offshore powerboat racing or whatever. Like, there's a lot of great. There's stuff a lot out of work there. though in that. That's not there really. Is. Yeah. So, we'll see. I don't know what's next, but it'll be something cool. And I'm always looking for something fun. So, definitely. Any offshore powerboat guys out there, or drag racers that <laughs> need some old stunt guy to come fill in a day or two. So you've done some offshore, you know. offshore, you know, drag racing and stuff. You, no, that's what no, I'm saying. That's on the list. But hey, it's right? on the list. Okay. I'm gonna cross that off before this next year, next couple of years is over. Yeah, I'm sure it'll so, happen. You put it out there, it'll happen. Yeah, that's how it kind of works, right? right? Especially people in our circle. I mean, you got so many different enthusiasts from different disciplines, and it, it's kind of endless. Yeah, for sure. A lot of opportunity. Absolutely, so. man. Cheers. Cheers to you. Good times, buddy. Appreciate and how old are you, bro? Old. Old. Hey, what's the age? Tell me. I don't ever tell my age. Why <laughs> do I don't want to do that? I'm just impressed.